sometimes all a great player needs to be great is a chance. Shaq Barrett bet on himself to get that chance as a Tampa Bay Buccaneer this season, and so far he hasn't just been great, he's been historically great. In just one month, he's racked up nine sacks, three forced fumbles, and 25 total pressures on top of a clutch interception on fourth down against the Rams. And believe it or not, even those gaudy numbers don't tell the whole story about just how dominant he has been. It hasn't mattered where he's lined up, who he's lined up against, or what style of rush he's used, Barrett has been productive game after game after game because he has mastered three critical things that all edge rushers need to succeed leverage, technique, and the ability to just straight up read an offense. Barrett may not be the most physically gifted pass rusher in the world, but the guy just understands football at a fundamental level that few other players do, and those three little things are really the only weapons that he needs. We'll start with leverage, because with Barrett only being 6'2 on a good day and with only 32 inch arms, he's one of the smaller edge rushers in the NFL. But that size does have one distinct advantage in that he always has naturally good leverage against taller, longer offensive tackles. Whether he's dipping around the edge or counter spinning inside, or as was the case against Carolina, just flat out bull rushing a left tackle into the back of the pocket, his naturally low pad level combined with his strength and tenaciousness make him very difficult to block. For some of the bigger tackles out there, it's almost like they're trying to dig out a tree stump that just won't budge because he's so low, so thick, and so strong, and they just can't get themselves down low enough to match that pad level without completely compromising their balance. He might not be able to outreach any starting tackles in the NFL, but in a way he kind of doesn't have to because they can't reach him either, or more importantly, they can't do it cleanly. And that brings me to Barrett's next major strengths, technique and versatility, which get set up by that leverage advantage and natural power in the first place. When Shaq rushes around the edge, he doesn't do so like some of the more, shall we say, talented rushers in the league do, because he doesn't have that kind of talent. He can't just burst off the line and beat a tackle's kick set with pure explosiveness like Von Miller or Miles Garrett. He has to get creative and versatile with his technique, because in the end, his technique is kind of all he's got. Typically after Shaq establishes that he can get under your pads and run you over with power and leverage, he really gets going with his true bread and butter, the power to speed move. Some coaches call it a skip and dip if you're familiar with that terminology instead. You've heard a lot of announcers and analysts talk about speed to power before, where you show like you're trying to run around the arc with speed, and then you turn that inside and convert the speed into power to bull rush straight through the blocker's inside shoulder. Khalil Mack does this all the time, it's kind of his signature thing. But Barrett does the opposite and he uses a power to speed move. He shows power so that he can bait the tackle into lunging out to get a punch in so that they can latch on and drop their anchor. And then once they lunge and take that bait on the power, he sidesteps or even jumps to the side around them to get back on track for a normal speed rush. And the tackle can't really react to it because they already slowed down their feet to anchor. And again, Barrett is so low to the ground that when he dips that inside shoulder, they have to bend themselves over and compromise their balance just to get their hands in the right position. They can't move their feet, they can't generate any power of their own, and Shaq is able to just crank those hips around and easily finish for a sack because it's almost like the tackle is stuck in quicksand while he's easily running around on pavement. Game after game he does this move and it works against all but the best, most freakishly talented tackles in the league because he's perfectly suited to use it. He's a small target to hit on the move, he's got great hands like a boxer to always deflect punches and keep his chest clean, and despite being really thick for his size at 250 pounds, he's got really good, flexible hips that can flatten angles quickly and convert pressures into sacks. It's all one extremely deadly combination of traits and technique, but it doesn't even stop there because Shaq also has multiple counter moves built into that counter move that he can pull out at any given time. Take his game-winning strip sack against the Rams last week as an example because it's one of the prettiest spin moves you're ever going to see. Look at how committed right tackle Rob Havenstein is to stopping that little skip and dip back out to the edge. His kick set is going extremely wide in his first two steps, and he's popped up almost vertically because he's doing everything he can to gain ground and choke off that angle to the edge. But this is really poor technique because he's leaving a window wide open back inside to win with the counter move. 
Offensive line coaches teach you that you need to tighten your arc and keep your chest square to the line of scrimmage so that you're not completely turned outside. Because if your hips and your chest are both basically perpendicular to the line of scrimmage, like Havenstein's are here, it makes it extremely difficult to open up your hips back inside and recover if you need to. So with Havenstein oversetting so hard outside, all Shaq has to do is just flare that outside leg out just a little bit like he's trying to jump to the edge again, and then use that as a plant leg to stop, spin, dip low, and uncoil back to the inside straight at Jared Goff. Game, set, match. 45 yards later, Nadama Kungsu rolls into the end zone, and the Bucks walk away with a huge road victory over the defending NFC champs all because of Shaq Barrett's pass rushing versatility. Well, maybe that's not entirely accurate. It wasn't solely because of his pass rush. He did make clutch plays in other ways too. And that brings me to my final point about what makes Barrett such a fantastic player. Instincts. The guy just finds a way to always be around the ball. His effort is non-stop, he's smart as hell, he always rushes with three different backup plans in case the first one is stopped cold, and most importantly, he knows how to read an offense and shut down whatever they're trying to do. His interception against Goff earlier in that same game is one of the most heads-up plays I've seen by a 3-4 outside linebacker in a long time. It's fourth down, two yards to go, and remember at this point it's still only an 11 point game with a lot of time left. This was a huge down that could have shifted momentum heavily for either side, but as the Rams got lined up, Shaq noticed something very important. Look at this, it's a short yardage play, and there's no running backs in the backfield. The Rams are an empty on fourth down with a bunch in a tight split to the offensive line, and they only need two yards. Right then and there, Barrett knows that there is zero chance that this ball is still gonna be in Jared Goff's hands by the time he can rush off the edge, so he's not even gonna try. And since it's clearly not a run play, he's not gonna stack up on the line of scrimmage and play the run either. There are only two possibilities here. Either it's a quick pass like a screen or a speed out to the right, or it's a quick pass to the left. And he's not gonna wait around to see which one it is. So after the snap, he doesn't even bother rushing Goff. He just makes a beeline to the flat to get in front of a throw that he expects to be coming. And of course those instincts paid off and Goff threw it right to him. Never mind the fact that it was a great play to knock the pass up in the air and intercept it himself to shut down the drive single-handedly, but just the fact that he was able to read the formation and immediately know what was happening, I mean, that's just flat out impressive. And once again, it shows that Shaq Barrett, above all else, is just a damn good football player. He's not big, he's not fast, he's not super explosive, but his abilities to master leverage, technique, and the mind games that all great pass rushers are able to play with offensive tackles, I mean, there's a reason why he's been by far the most productive edge rusher in the league so far this season. He's doing everything. I know that it's easy to say that there's no way he can keep this pace up, or that there's no way that Shaq freaking Barrett of all people is going to lead the league in sacks over a big name star like Mack or Garrett or Donald or Watt, but at this point, can you really doubt him? It's not like these are fluky sacks or schemed up pressures. Barrett is legitimately beating the brakes off of every offensive lineman in front of him, and he's not showing any signs of slowing down yet. For most edge rushers, nine sacks, three forced fumbles, and an interception is a good season. But for Barrett, that's a good month. Hell, only one other player in NFL history has done this to start a season, and it was Mark Gastineau when he set the then single season sack record back in 1984. I mean, this is rare, rare territory we're talking about here, and I for one can't wait to see just how many sacks Barrett can rack up by the time December rolls around. Can he be the first player to hit 23 in a year, and can he then leverage that success to make an ungodly amount of money when he hits free agency in 2020? That's tough to say, but I do know this. Shaq Barrett is a great football player, and like all great football players, sometimes for that greatness to be recognized, all they needed was a chance. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode, and of course thank you as well to our season-long sponsor that kind of helps make this show possible in the first place, MyBookie. If you're thinking about putting a few bucks down on the Bucks or <laughs> any other team this weekend because you like some of the juicy lines they've got for week five, 
head on down to that link in the description below and use promo code Brett on my bookie for a 100% deposit bonus on your initial deposit on anything up to $1,000. That will essentially double your bankroll, which means if you can hit on these bets and keep hitting on them, by the end of the season, you'll end up with a hell of a lot more winnings than you would have without that bonus. So it's very much worth it, especially if you're gonna be betting and winning anyway, because it just kind of amplifies all of your winnings. Right now, I think the line in that Tampa Bay New Orleans game, since we're on the subject, is plus three for the Bucks, which honestly isn't too bad for them. It means, you know, New Orleans is only favored by three. And uh, I think with Tampa kind of outperforming all of our expectations, or at least my expectations, and with Drew Brees still out, that should be a really close game. So plus three is probably fair. My personal bet on this game will depend a lot on the injury reports as we get closer to kickoff. But if Chris Godwin's hip is still okay, and if Carlton Davis is playing, he kind of got banged up a little bit last week against the Rams uh, late in the game on special teams. I kind of like for the Bucks for the upset here, at least against the spread, which it, it sounds crazy, but this is a really, really explosive offense. So I, I kind of like them there. And if you're interested in putting any money down on that game or any other game in week five, again, just hit that link in the description below, go to my bookie, use promo code Brett and go get that deposit bonus. As for me, uh, I will be back later this week with another picks video to break down one game in particular against the spread. Not entirely sure which game yet, but in all likelihood, it will be that Monday nighter between Cleveland and the 49ers because it just fascinates me for a whole lot of different reasons. And then next week, I'll have another full film room episode coming out as usual. So I'll be back soon. And yeah, until then, later.